podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, OSHA's Top 10, Analysis of the Most Cited Workplace Safety Violations in 2017. We're glad you could join us. My name is James. I run our webinar and events program here at Triumvirate Environmental, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before I turn things over to our speaker, just want to run through a few housekeeping items, make sure we're all on the same page. You may have noticed that when you signed on, your microphone has been muted. We ask that if you have any questions or a technical issue comes up, please use the questions box, and that's over on the right-hand side of your screen. There will also be live interactive polling. We've got uh, one poll on today's webinar, uh, and it's coming up at the top of the webinar, so be sure to participate in that. And stay on until the end, as there will be an open question and answer period. We want to hear from you, so feel free to ask any questions by typing them into your chat pane over on the right. In the event we don't get to all of the questions, we'll follow up with you in the coming days. And last but not least, you will receive a copy of the slide deck and the recording tomorrow. That's always a popular question, so you will get these materials. Our speaker today is Mark Liffers. Mark is Practice Director of EHS Consulting here at Triumvirate, where he provides on-site technical support and outsourced program management to a wide range of technology-based research, manufacturing, and construction clients. His areas of technical expertise include biosafety, industrial hygiene, occupational health and safety, radiation safety, and more. Mark has a Master of Science degree in industrial hygiene from the Harvard School of Public Health. And with that, I'll turn things over to Mark. All right. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, James, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. For this webinar, we, we want to talk a little bit, or actually more than a little bit, about the uh, uh, the top 10 classes of OSHA violations uh, based on the uh, 2016 data that we have. And with each topic, we want to talk a little bit about what some of the requirements for that topic are. So we'll be going into that. And then finally, uh, we'll be talking about recommendations for avoiding citations. Before we get into that, though, we have a poll question. James, you want to walk folks through this? Yep, so we're launching that poll right now. Uh, how prepared are you for your next OSHA inspection? And you'll see the options there on your screen. Everything from we're feeling very prepared to, to not so prepared at all. So uh, select your, your options there and we'll share those with the group. We'll give everyone a few more seconds. All right, looking good. Let's close that and push the results. So Mark, we've got 66% selected. We need some minor updates to our OSHA programs. 22% feel very prepared and another 12% need significant updates to their programs. All right, good, good. So we're, you know, mostly in a good place and uh, this is typically what we see. Some folks need a, need a fair amount of work and uh, you know, others are, are fairly uh, ready. So let's, let's get into our, our uh, presentation. Uh, first of all, um, I thought it would be a good idea since there have been a number of changes to just give us an update as to what's going on uh, with, with OSHA. Uh, for those of you folks who have more than uh, a certain number of employees in certain high-risk in industries, I think you know you have to submit your accident and incident records electronically and the original rule had us doing that by July 1st of this year, and uh, we now have until tomorrow, uh, December 1st, to get those submitted. So just a, a reminder on that. The other rule is the what's called the Volks rule. <clears throat> the original OSHA Act basically uh, prohibited OSHA from issuing citations for any injury or illness, uh, record-keeping violations, that fell outside of uh, the OSHA Act six months statute of, statute of limitation, which means if you had a, uh, an injury that should have been either recorded or reported, um, and it was discovered more than six months after that injury occurred or the reporting requirement was met, OSHA couldn't cite you on that. In late December of 2016, um, 
what's called the Volks Rule, and this, this arises from a 2012 uh, court case with OSHA. OSHA was allowed to cite employers for failure to record an injury or illness uh, up to six months following the five-year record retention period. We all know we have to keep our OSHA records for, for a minimum of five years, and that allowed folks to uh, basically look within that much bigger window to cite employers. Um, the uh, Trump administration in April of this year basically rescinded that rule, so now we're back to our uh, basically six months look back. We did, in fact, uh, have a client that had this rule basically eliminate OSHA from bringing action against them. They had an, an accident that had occurred uh, more than six months after it was uh, identified as a reportable um, the uh, employer did make a late report to OSHA. OSHA wanted to cite them for it. Um, the, uh, uh, the rescission of this rule basically negated OSHA's ability to do that. So uh, we've seen it uh, play out in real time. I think all of us know that OSHA has a number of uh, uh, proposed uh, and ongoing rulemaking actions that they're, they're working on. Um, recently, Certain proposed or, or uh, actual rulemakings have been moved to what are called long-term actions, which uh, basically takes them off the table. There's nothing going on with them. And that includes OSHA's long-time endeavor to update its uh, chemical exposure, permissible exposure limits, um, hearing protection for construction workers, and an initiative to try to reduce vehicle backing hazards in general industry and construction. So these uh, are not going to be acted on for the foreseeable future. Rulemaking that has been indefinitely delayed includes reform to the process safety management standard that was developed in response to the 2013 West Texas fertilizer plant explosion. I think a lot of us remember that. Uh, new regulations addressing emergency response and preparedness and new standard to address infectious diseases in healthcare. These are still on the table, but they're not being worked. What remains active is a uh, new standard addressing, addressing communications tower safety. Uh, we all know that we have a number of cell towers, communication towers. People have to access those towers. A lot of working at height issues. Updates to the powered industrial truck standard and amendments to the regulations for mechanical power presses. So these are still active and hopefully we'll, we'll see some, uh, some of the uh, act results of these activities shortly. OSHA penalties, which have been in, increased uh, within the past few years, uh, remain. So serious violations can uh, receive a penalty of up to 12675 per violation. Same for failure to abate. And willful or repeated willful violations, 126,749 per violation. <clears throat> Excuse me. To get to our, our top 10 um, OSHA enforcement topics, in 2016, OSHA conducted almost 32,000 inspections. 19,000 of them were unprogrammed. And out of those inspections, OSHA issued nearly 60,000 total violations. And I think we all know that we can go very easily to the OSHA website and we can look up any particular company um, that uh, OSHA has inspected and see what the results of those inspections and violations are. The top 10 violations that we see, and this is very consistent year after year, we have fall protection, hazard communication, scaffolding, respiratory protection, lockout tagout, ladders, powered industrial trucks, machine guarding, fall protection, uh, the training requirements for fall protection. So they, um, they get us for that. And then electrical, which is a perennial, uh, primarily wiring methods. For fall protection, 6,000 violations, many in the industrial sector. And I think we all know that OSHA requires fall protection to be provided and for the general industry whenever you have an elevation of four feet or higher where you could fall and six feet working at height in the construction industry. Where we look for guidance for fall protection is really the ANSI Z3, Z359 series of standards. And this is where we'll find the requirements for personal fall arrest systems, uh, 
fall, fall protection programs. How do we put together a comprehensive fall protection program? Uh, positioning and travel restraint systems and safety requirements for assisted rescue and self-rescue systems. So if you, are, if you have people that are working at height and you want to look at the, the appropriate fall protection uh, devices and standards, they need to follow the uh, Z359 series of, of standards. For hazard communication, 4,176 violations. And we all know hazard communication is the standard that requires a number of things. First, chemical manufacturers have to classify the hazards of the chemicals they're producing or importing. They have to uh, generate safety data sheets to present these hazards. All employers have the obligation to provide this information to their employees about the hazardous chemicals to which they're exposed. And they need to do this through a written hazard communication program identifying labels, other forms of warning, how do we access safety data sheets, and we have to train our people. We need to develop, implement, and maintain a program at each workplace, and our program has to describe the criteria for how we select labels and other forms of warning. So we have a, a lot of ways we can communicate hazards, and these need to be described in our hazard communication program. Also, how are we going to train our people? We need to maintain lists of hazardous chemicals known to be present at the workplace. We need to uh, be able to identify these, these chemicals and use that to access the appropriate safety data sheet. And our plan needs to talk about how we're going to inform employees of the hazards of, of non-routine tasks. Say we have a, a cleaning process, a maintenance process, what do we do in a process upset, and how do we uh, use these temporary labels and uh, procedures to uh, to communicate those hazards. We need to make the program available upon request to employees, their representatives, to OSHA itself. And if employees are working at more than one geographical location, um, we can keep our hazard communication program at their primary workplace facility. But again, these programs and the safety data sheets have to be available to, to employees. Scaffolding is another popular item for OSHA. Uh, typically we'll see these at construction sites, uh, 3,288 violations for that. We can have uh, staging, we can have suspended scaffolds, um, typically uh, you'll see window washers will use a, a type of a suspended scaffold. Supported scaffolds, these need to be designed by a, a qualified competent person and inspected by a, a qualified person. Typically, you'd see a, a professional engineer to do that. Um, you may not think of it, but, but scissor lifts and aerial lifts fall under the, uh, the OSHA uh, scaffolding rules. Primary fatalities when folks are using aerial lifts um, are typically, if they're in the bucket, bucket's elevated, the person is not clipped in to the bucket, and the, the vehicle is struck by another vehicle, uh, people will be, will be ejected from the bucket. So that's uh, uh, the most uh, common fatality uh, associated with these things. Other types of issues, you're working on an uneven terrain and your, your aerial lift or your scissor lift can, can tip over. And operation in high winds can also affect the safety of these devices. Respiratory protection is a uh, uh, number four on our list with 3,097 violations. And I think we all know that if the employer is going to be providing respirators for employees, we need to make sure that the equipment is, is not going to be harmful to the worker just, just for wearing the equipment. You wear a respirator, it puts a strain on your system. The employer needs to provide respirators that are suitable for the purpose intended, which means I can't use a particular particulate filter uh, if I have a vapor hazard. I need to have a written program for that. I need to assign a respiratory protection program coordinator. I need to have a system to maintain my respirators. And I also need to uh, make sure that I medically qualify and fit test my people if I'm providing the respirators. Uh, a question frequently comes up with the use of N95 respirators. Uh, these are these are considered a, a filtering face piece respirator by OSHA. 
And if we provide those disposable N95 respirators to our workers on a voluntary basis, we need to uh, basically give the employee a, a copy of the OSHA Appendix D, which explains to them you know, how to care and maintain um, the respirator. But we don't need to have a written respiratory protection program for that. We don't need to do the medical evaluation or fit testing. Again, if there's, there's no, uh, we're not exceeding any PELs, and it's a completely voluntary basis. If we're requiring the employees to wear that respirator, you say it's that disposable N95, um, then we do need to give them a medical evaluation and we do need to fit test them for it. So there's a little, um, you know, people get a little confused about that. OSHA has an interpret a letter of interpretation uh, from 2011 that uh, clarifies their position on this as well. Lockout tagout, 27, 2877 violations um, in 2016. And lockout tagout is the standard that covers us whenever we're servicing or maintaining a machine and we're concerned about the unexpected energization or startup of the machine uh, or the release of stored energy that could harm, harm employees. So if I'm working on a machine, it could be uh, something as simple, or simple as a copy machine, I want to make sure that when I'm working on that machine, it, it is at a zero energy state so that it's not going to start up unexpectedly um, and harm someone who's working on it. The lockout tagout standard establishes minimum performance requirements for working on equipment. I think we all know that if my machine has a single energy input, say it's uh, a knife switch on the wall or if it's a cord and plug, uh, then I don't need to have a written lockout tagout procedure for that. Uh, if my piece of equipment has more than one energy input, say I'm working on a piece of equipment that's uh, plugged into the wall, say 220 volts, it's got compressed air going into it, um, it might have steam or other energy input into it, then I need to have a written lockout tagout procedure. And these procedures have to clearly and specifically out outline uh, the scope, purpose, authorization, rules, and techniques that I'm going to use to control that hazardous energy. And that includes shutting down, isolating, blocking, securing the machine, the machine uh, procedural steps for placing, removing, and transferring my lockout devices. How am I going to test the machine? Uh, I think we've all heard of the, uh, the term lock, tag, and try. Lock, lock my machine out, tag it so we know who's working on it, that it is locked out, and then try to operate the machine or device to verify that it's in that, that zero energy state. Ladders, another popular one from OSHA, primarily under the construction standard, 2,241 violations for um, use and abuse of ladders. Falls from portable ladders, that would be step ladders, straight ladders, extension ladders, are one of the leading causes of occupational fatalities and injuries. If I'm using a step ladder, one thing I don't want to do is use that step ladder to access another height. And I think we've all seen people do that. Um, if I need to access another level, say it's a mezzanine or a roof, I want to use a straight ladder for that. If I'm using a step ladder, good rule of thumb is never let my knees go above the top of that step ladder. If I'm using a straight ladder, we, we know we want to have that four to one ratio up four feet, out, four, out one foot from the wall. A good way to test that in the field, if you're using a straight ladder, say I want to access a roof, is I'll put the base of the ladder at my feet, I'll stand straight up, I'll extend my arms uh, horizontally, and if I'm at approximately the right angle, my fingers should be just touching that ladder. So I'm, I'm forming a bit of a V with that ladder. So it's a good way to field check that you have your straight ladder at the right angle. If I'm using that ladder to access a roof, I want to have my ladder at least three feet above the roof edge. It's much easier to get off of a ladder onto a roof, uh, much harder to get back onto that ladder uh, to come down again. OSHA updated its uh, walking working surface rules for general industry in 2016. And as a part of that update, OSHA combined its separate regulations for wood ladders, portable metal ladders, fixed ladders under one comprehensive ladder standard. So it's a bit easier you know, to look at the regulations for that. 
powered industrial trucks, and uh, even an off-road vehicle uh, would be considered a powered industrial truck. Uh, 2,162 violations, primarily fork, primarily fork trucks, and OSHA defines a powered industrial truck as a mobile power propelled truck used to carry, push, pull, lift, stack, or tier materials. So this is a wide variety of vehicles. If I'm going to be operating a fork truck, a powered industrial truck, my employer needs to have a training program. Typically, this will be a classroom type of a program where we'll go over the general principles of safe truck operations, the types of vehicles being used, the hazards they create. I need to train my people into how to do the job properly. Uh, I need to give my workers on-the-job training. And typically, the way we'll do this is we will run my potential, my new operators, through a, a classroom uh, lecture, you know, open book type of a training, uh, assign them to a trained licensed operator, let them operate the vehicle under the supervision of that trained operator, and then after they're determined to be competent, we'll give them a uh, written road test so that we can, uh, we can be sure that they, they know how to do the job that they're supposed to be doing. And it's important that when you do the road test for your people that you run them through the, the types of things that they're going to be typically doing. If it's a warehouse environment, you're going to be loading and unloading uh, pallets, say, from racks. We want them to do that as a part of the road test. And again, as an employer, we need to certify each operator has received the training, and we need to reevaluate each operator's performance at least once every three years. So every three years, run them through a refresher training, uh, run them through a a practical uh, road test and recertify them. Machine guarding, 1,933 violations. Amputations, we think of machine guarding, we think of amputations. We think of chains on sprockets, we think of uh, belts on pulleys, we think of uh, moving machinery that can pinch people. So. With machine guarding, there's a wide variety of, of machines and equipment from uh, standard machine shop tools and equipment. Uh, we have robotics, uh, machines that, that operate you know, um, autonomously, and we need to make sure that these are appropriately guarded. So where do we look for guidance with this? We, we look for the uh, ANSI B11 series of standards. This is a, a group of nearly three dozen different documents that deal with machine, machinery, machine tool safety, and they will specify the requirements for both suppliers, people who are manufacturing the machines, what we need to use uh, to make sure that they're appropriately guarded, and users of machines. So if you have a, a drill press or a table saw, uh, you want to make sure you have the, the current guarding for that. We'd refer back to the ANSI B11 series of standards. OSHA will cite these under its general duty clause if they're doing an inspection uh, for machine guarding. Fall protection, 1,523 violations. Usually if someone falls, is seriously injured, OSHA will come in. They probably have the right equipment, but they haven't been properly trained. So what we want to make sure is that we do train our people properly if they're using fall protection. So if you have people working at height, say they're wearing a, a harness um, with a, a fall restraint device, whether it's a, a tether or a retractable lanyard, uh, we want to put it, actually put it on the person. Make sure they know how to don it and doff it properly. Make sure that they, you'll be surprised, some people will put on a harness and they'll, they'll kind of step into it backwards, you know, until they figure it out. You want to make sure they know how to, how to use it. Uh, make sure that they understand how to attach, you know, their tether. If you have people entering, say, a uh, uh, confined space, uh, a good example of fall protection for someone in entering a confined space is that tripod. You want to make sure that they understand how to assemble it properly um, and how to, how to operate, you know, that tripod when someone's entering that space. And again, as with the fork truck training, performance-based methods are most effective. Make sure your people suit up. You know, they check the equipment. They know what a lanyard is. They know what a D-ring is. They know what a carabiner is. Um, classroom training is good, but field training really is the best. 
And when you're training people, you always want to verify the training with a qualified person. Make sure it's someone who actually knows how to do this, is experienced in it, and can evaluate how well people are doing with that. And not just this training, but whatever training we're doing, we always want to make sure that a qualified person is available to answer questions. So if we have a computer-based uh, video system for training people, make sure you have a qualified person available, uh, however you do it, to answer those questions. And then OSHA's favorite, you know, the perennial electrical wiring methods. OSHA will still cite you for extension cords in place for more than 90 days, I believe. Um, they'll cite you for basically exposed uh, electrical conductors. Um, and this, although it's kind of a housekeeping thing, we want to make sure that we, uh, we address that. And our reference for that is NFPA 70, the National Electrical Code. The other, the other piece of the electrical code we should all be familiar with is NFPA 70E, which is the arc flash portion of the electrical code. And we want to make sure that all of our employees who are exposed to voltages, uh, live voltages, who may access a power panel um, are aware of the arc flash requirements and PPE requirements for that. So with that, we want to talk a little bit about strategies for improving your, your OSHA program. If we go back to Safety 101, it's real simple, right? We, we uh, you know, can put together a safety program, just have management set, set safety policies and procedures, make sure after we hire people, we train them on safe work practices, have our supervisors watch workers or have them watch each other to prevent unsafe actions and then conduct inspections to find safety problems, which are then corrected. Real simple, right? One simple slide with four bullets can put together a whole OSHA program. Uh, not. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I think all of us know it can be really, really interesting to have our management set meaning, meaningful, effective safety policies and procedures. We need to think a lot about it. What are our issues? You know, what, what do our risk assessments say? When we're training people, what do we need to train them for? To what level do we need to train, what, to train them? What constitutes effective training? This is going to vary workplace by workplace, but we need to make sure that we do that. Watching people and critiquing them and giving them pointers to prevent unsafe actions can be very difficult in some environments. People don't like to have people tell them, hey, you know, there's a better way to do that. So there's some real skills to be had in doing that. And then putting together an effective inspection program. A lot of us use checklist inspections, and a lot of us look at the same things, like fire extinguishers, you know, uh, mounted uh, at a certain height on the wall, or maintaining that 18-inch clearance from, from sprinklers. But I suspect if a lot of us would look at actual accidents and incidents and near misses that we have and the root causes for them, and then we line them up against our standard inspection program, we're probably going to find a disconnect. We're going to probably find that unsafe actions and attitudes create a lot of accidents and incidents that are straight, look at the uh, physical conditions in the workplace. Uh, isn't picking up in our inspection program. So we need to really spend some time looking at our inspection program. What is it we want to look at? We should be looking at actions of people, at the attitudes of people, as well as what our physical workplace looks at. So even though at the 50,000 foot level, safety is a simple thing, implementing it really takes a lot of, of time and effort on everyone's part. So summarizing. We talked a little bit about OSHA rulemaking. We talked about the uh, top 10 OSHA fines and penalties that we see. And basically, the top 10 is a good survey of what the most common safety programs that we have are. And finally, we need to have a clear strategy in our workplace. We need to understand what our risks are, what our hazards are, what's actually causing our accidents and near misses and then make sure that our policies, our procedures, our training, our inspection and feedback programs are really addressing 
the root causes of, of our accidents. So we need to be, be thinking a lot about that as we move forward with our programs. And that, guys, is, uh, is, is my piece of it. So uh, I think James will do what? Open it up to uh, questions? Yes, we will. Thank you, Mark. Uh, at this point, we will open the floor to questions. We, we had a few submitted, um, so let's get those in. I'll talk a bit about our follow-up to the webinar as you're typing your questions. Uh, we got a, a pretty big group, a little over 100 people, so I imagine there are a couple questions out there. Um, if something comes up after today, feel free to shoot Mark an email. I'm sure he'd uh, be happy to address your question uh, down the road. So. Um, as you're doing that, I just want to mention that uh, you will receive this presentation. I know some people came on a little bit late. Um, you'll get the presentation and the recording of today's webinar to listen back to, uh, share with your colleagues. Um, that's yours to keep. We're also going to include a link to a short survey. We'd appreciate your feedback on the webinar and any ideas you have for future topics. Um, we're getting close to the, the end of the year here. We're planning for 2018. Um, so please let us know what you'd like to learn more about in the eh &S world. We'd also like to offer you an opportunity to speak with a consultant about one of your OSHA programs to better prepare for your next inspection. So you'll see a, a link on the screen. I'll also include one in the chat box. Feel free to, to click on that and, and fill out a brief form um, to schedule your uh, complimentary uh, review of one of your OSHA programs. We'll get you in touch with someone to do that. So uh, without further ado, let's get to, let's get to those questions. Mark, first question comes from Sarah. Regarding ladder safety, is a written program required? Okay, uh, Sarah, no. Uh, a written program is not required for, for ladder safety. But you want to make sure you have the elements that you would have in a, in a written program. So you make sure you have a, a system where you train your people, uh, a way to uh, basically inspect you know, your ladders that you have on site. Um, so, but no, a, a written program is not required. Great, and I've got a second one from Sarah. Regarding the arc flash, if a company has competent in-house electricians, can they conduct the electrical system evaluation themselves, or does it have to be a certified power slash electrical firm? It, it, it's usually beyond the capability of a, of a plant electrician to do that because it's, it's really an engineering review of the system, and they're looking at things like inrush power, uh, the, the trip time for your circuit breakers, you know, the wattage, uh, but, but no, as far as the, the requirements as to who conducts the survey, uh, it's, it's pretty open on that. Most people will use the electrical engineering firm that designed or has built the, uh, the infrastructure, the, the, the system for the, for the plant. All right, next question is from Ahmed. Can you share some common root causes identified in OSHA findings for some of the, the most common findings we've talked about? Any insight into those root causes? Oh, I, I can tell you. It's uh, yeah, and and you, it, as as you drill down, you're going to find that it's it's management uh, involvement and commitment um, and training and enforcement of the rules. So uh, uh, regardless of what program you're looking at, if you have problems with the program, you drill down. You, you're going to find that we didn't have policies or procedures. Uh, we weren't. Uh, management wasn't enforcing the rules, and we weren't doing a good job training. All right, thanks, Mark. That's that's actually uh, you know the, the universal answer to ed, almost any safety uh, uh, safety issue. Ultimately, it's management responsibility and training. So, uh, Lynn, Lynn asks Mark if a contractor is coming onto the property to do something on the ceiling, which would probably need a scissor lift. Who's responsible for making sure that the OSHA standards are followed? Oh boy, you're, you're, you're getting into the OSHA multi-employer workplace doctrine now. Uh, uh, ultimately, the, the owner of the building, whoever hires that contractor, is going to have responsibility. Uh, the contractor himself or herself uh, is, is primarily responsibility for the safety of their people, but by, merely by hiring that person, you you still have liability if that if that worker is injured. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Um, so, uh, Mark, what what needs to be submitted to OSHA by December first related to reportables? It, it would be basic. Uh, it, it's basically your uh, the same the uh, the OSHA three hundred log data. 
um, needs to be submitted electronically instead of uh, doing your doing your end of your wrap up. The same thing you post on the wall basically is now an electronic submittal that you need to submit. Okay, and to clarify, um, Allison followed up with a question. Um, if, if that's December 1st or, or the 15th? Um, it's, yeah, December 1st, and that's for the previous year. Okay. All right. Now, next one, we've got lots of questions. Thank you, everyone. We'll do our best to get to them all. Um, Laura asks, if you have an outside contractor coming on site to service equipment, which would require lockout tagout procedures? Is it the site's responsibility to have the written plan, procedures, et cetera, or is it the outside contractor? It, this, this is going to be a, it's, it's going to be the contractor. And this, this goes back to the importance of as a person or entity that's hiring a contractor, you should have a contractor safety program where you're going to specify very clearly uh, the programs that your contractor is going to need and follow. Uh, you may elect to have the contractor follow your program, and, and that's, that's okay to do, but you need to make sure they're trained to your program. But typically, you'll require that the, the contractor have an OSHA-compliant lockout tagout program and, and follow that program. Uh, a lot of employers will have a system where um, the safety or facility people uh, will put their lock on as well as the contractor when you're locking out a piece of equipment. So it, it's, I hate to say it's going to vary, but the contractor primarily needs to have a program, and then they need to adhere to whatever the site uh, requirements are in addition to that. Got it. And uh, any follow-up questions, feel free to, to type those in. Uh, we're just going to roll through here. Um, okay. Gene asks, what is the value of OSHA VPP to weigh against additional reporting? The, the value of OSHA VPP, I... Yeah, it, it exempts you from, you know, uh, certain inspections. Um, the, the value of an OSHA VPP program primarily is you've really raised the safety awareness of your site. You're, you're working the culture of your site. Uh, you're, you're, you're compliant with OSHA, but typically OSHA VPP people are, are well beyond compliance. So, so the real value, it's not, yeah, you're exempted from some, some OSHA you know, inspectional activities and, and reporting activities. But the real value is what you're doing for your company, what you're doing for your people, you know, as far as the safety program. It's, it's uh, kind of like ISO 14000 on the environmental side. It's a way to demonstrate that you really have a, a uh, world-class safety culture and safety program. All right, we've got a few more left. Um, I think we'll, we'll take a couple more minutes here. Uh, last call for questions. And uh, we'll get to as many as we can. Mark, this one is specific to gun ranges, um, so I'll throw this one out there. Do gun ranges require are required by OSHA to have explosion-proof vacuums to do cleanup on the range for lead powder and unspent ammo, or is a HEPA vacuum sufficient? That's a good one. I haven't I haven't run into that. I've done some lead testing at, in firing ranges. Um, I, I would say this this really goes to you know, do we have a combustible or reactive dust? And I would, I would say that we'd need to base that on a, on a risk assessment of what we're doing there. And then as we're cleaning it up, you know, uh, does that dust constitute a hazard? And uh, we, we've done a fair amount of explosive, explosive dust work. And typically the, what you do is you take a sample of the, of the dust, you'd send it out to a, a lab that specializes in that. They would tell you what the reactivity or explosivity of that dust is, and that would that would tell you uh, what what you need in your specific instance. But but uh, that's something I actually don't have uh, experience doing. All right, thanks for sharing. I believe this is our last question. Um, if there's less than ten employees, uh, do you not have to submit reports if that's the case? Um, if you have less than ten employees, you're, you're exempted from you know the OSHA. Uh, the OSHA log and, and posting. Um, you still need to keep accident and incident records. Uh, you'll, you'll need to have accident reports to submit to your worker's compensation carrier. So you need to keep a, a good portion of the records that you're exempted from. Okay. Um, and I, I lied before. I think we have one last one. So uh, let's take our last question. Um, why is it required to have an anchor point that is independent of the scaffolding structure, 
even if the structure is robust? Uh, if the if the scaffolding slips and falls, you you want to make sure that your person is is uh, is anchored, you know, and they're not going to go down with it. And that's the intent of that. Got it. Hey, Mark. Thanks. Looks like we got to all the questions. Uh, we didn't lose too many people. We hope we kept your interest today. Um, Mark, thanks for for presenting. Do you have any final thoughts? No, I, I just want to wish everyone, you know, uh, a, a good end to the year. You know, look forward to next year, and uh, hopefully we can all work. You know, to make next year a safer year for, for all of our people. Thanks. Great point. Um, thanks again for attending, everyone. Great questions. And uh, again, look out uh, in your inbox tomorrow for these resources. Take care and have a great rest of the day. Yep. Thanks, everybody.